Hello, welcome to The Believe Show. I'm thrilled today to have on the show as our guest, Philip Myman. Hi, Philip. Hi, Sanya, how are you? <laughs> I'm thrilled to have him on. Philip is my brother. So let me tell you a few things about him before we get started. And I'll also show you his website while I'm, while I'm telling you. His website is at philipmyman.com if you would like to visit his website. And who, who is this Philip Myman? He's a professor of analytics and the director of the master's in business analytics at the Fairfield University Dolan School of Business. When you go to his website, you can see a lot about what he's done, especially the, the articles he's written, the various companies he's consulted for. Pretty much he's awesome. Welcome to the show, Philip. Well, thank you. I think you're awesome too. <laughs> Let's start with the first question, which is about the Believe Show. What is something that you believe that others in your field would not agree with you about? Uh, this is gonna sound very controversial, but I don't think people are buckets. What does that mean? Um, and to be a little bit clear, I think many people would disagree without thinking about it clearly, uh, but not really at Fairfield University, but I'll tell you more about that later. Um, the basic idea is if you're talking to somebody, you're trying to teach them in pedagogy, education, there's an implicit belief um, by many, and I used to feel this way too, that other people are buckets. How does knowledge get transferred? You just pour what you know into somebody else and then they have it and they walk away and they can pour a little bit, right? Um, and it's hard to escape that imagery. If you say people aren't buckets, yeah, of course they're not a bucket, right? It's not a pail. These are human, live, breathing, whatever. But uh, when we're talking to people, even now, I still suffer from this. Like I'm talking to you now, I'm trying to explain what I think, right? Of course. And Maybe you've had the same experience too. You just start dumping a bunch of information on people because what you're saying, you're thinking like 10 steps ahead, what you want to tell them at the end. But you got to know what I'm saying now too. So let me just dump this into you. Okay, now let's, you know it, let's move on, right? That's the wrong way to communicate. I'll even add, you're talking in the context of pedagogy, being a professor, but I'll even say in one-on-one -on -one in interactions, sometimes you people ask you and you want to tell them a lot of things. It's not just one sentence. So I can see it happening in both interactions, one-on-one -on -one and large group. Totally. And, and any relationship, right? You, you have like a lot you want to say. Um, children have this a lot, right? They have like big speeches they need to give. And they start tripping over their words because they can't get to the end point fast enough, right? It, uh, so, it's great to see little kids who both show up at preschool and they and they both have lots to share. This is what happened this morning. This is what happened. No question about what else is going on in other people's lives. So yes, I agree with you. It starts early for us. Yeah, and it's it's hard to get rid of, but it's a, it's a there is a way to have a model of people that based on epistemology and Karl Popper and David Deutsch and all this other stuff that ultimately just comes to recognizing that we are human beings. We are unique. We're we're like computers but on a slightly higher level. And we're all the same in that we're all special and we can all understand. Anything that can be explained or understand it by, understood by anybody can be understood by everybody. How does that change how you teach what you just said? Uh, you no longer think of people as buckets, but as individual humans who generate knowledge through a process of conjecture and criticism. And if that's the case, then the way to teach them isn't to tell them facts, but to give them hints so they can come up with the idea that you already have. Try it on me. Um, suppose I wanted to uh, teach you something in Excel. Uh, here's how you do flash fill. Do you guys, do you, have you ever used flash fill? Yep, I never used oh, it. It's one of the most amazing inventions of all of humankind. I, I've never used it much before either, but it's really remarkable. But so this is already, I'm trying to tell you to get you in a frame of mind of thinking about what it might possibly be rather than just telling you, right? Um, and the next step would be, let's open up a spreadsheet. I'll show you once how it works. It'll give you a clue, a hint of how it works. The basic idea, suppose you have a bunch of data and you wanna get everyone's last name out of it. You have full names. You would in a separate cell type the person's last name and then you say flash fill, meaning M Mr. Bill Gates, Microsoft Excel, go ahead and figure out what I mean and try to do it to all the cells. In what situations would I be doing this? I'm doing a mail merge or getting a lot of people. Whatever in. you're doing. So you have some data. You want to get everyone's last name. So you have a list of names. You have Senya Maiman, Philip Maiman, every other Maiman. So you type, say, Senya into the, the next column, and then you hit flash fill, and you see. And it will figure out that, oh, now I need to get Philip. Then I need to get whatever. Make sense? Okay. I could see how I could use it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, he, how would you if, you, if I just showed you that that's how it works, and I assume you know it, um, then I could move on and if I give you a quiz, what I found is uh, 
it's changed a little bit in Zoom, and I'll tell you why later. But uh, what I found is if you presume that way, if you treat people that way as if they're sort of buckets, and I just taught you like this, and I give you a quiz, uh, half the people still don't get it. Half the people got it, but I don't know how many of them knew it already. Um, but most simply won't. And you get surprised when you give a quiz that they just – they didn't get it yet. The reason they didn't get it, it was my fault. I treated them like buckets. I said, here's what it is. Done. Let's have a quiz. Instead, if you create a puzzle or a mystery or something that they need to generate the knowledge to try to solve, I mean, as simple as how could this possibly work? What do you think? And people come up with ideas. How could, how could it possibly know what I'm trying to do here? Right? Then you're starting to create possible explanations in your mind. You're critiquing the ones that seem bad, right? And you're coming up with some way of understanding it. Then that's boom. Then it doesn't even matter whether I quiz you or not. This is something you'll know for the rest of your life. So to generalize, it sounds like to teach me a specific thing, you have to get me curious about it. Um, I don't know if I can get you. I think, yes, maybe. I th yes, I think I agree with you. Because uh, one of the other things I like to do is uh, create puzzles. And if you create a puzzle, um, then people are thinking. I, I think it's better to spend an hour with people coming up with wrong explanations for a puzzle and seeing why those explanations were wrong rather than just give them the answer. So this is much more time intensive. It is, but the foundation is much stronger. And then when you learn new things, they fit in better. You know how it used to be. You'd study, and that still is, right? You study for a quiz or a test, you forget everything the next day. What's the point? Who wins? Who's that benefiting? Nobody. But if you learned it yourself, if you taught yourself something, you'll never forget it, right? And this applies uh, not just to undergraduate, but also to graduate education also to professional conferences when you're when you're presenting to other academics to, to business leaders as you said in personal relationships um uh, i i used to and i still have this problem i still i talk, tend to talk faster and faster and faster if there's no questions right because i'm assuming everyone's with me and i'm implicitly again thinking they're a bucket and they're over full and i need to dump something out to make more room for what i'm about to tell them. i just keep going 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 until um eyes start to glaze over or something, right? And that's the that's the issue that used to happen before Zoom. When you're teaching a classroom with uh, lots of live people, uh, there's a selection bias. Whose eyes do you look at? The people who are looking back at you or the ones who are looking away or looking down, right? So if you're looking at the people who are looking at you, you see, oh, they're with me. You start going faster and faster and faster. And you, everyone else is gone. On Zoom, it's a little bit better because uh, even when they're not with you, they still tend to look at the camera, right? So then I could see that they're not quite getting it. You know what I mean? Uh, that's why it's better to, to twist it around and, and have, um, you know, things like flipped classroom make a lot of sense. Learn something at home, then come in with questions where you're generating new explanations, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, that said, what I was going to mention before, uh, I, I think this is an implicit bias that almost all human beings have, that other people are buckets that we need to dump information into, right? And that's why people forget, oh, my bucket is full. But that's not why people forget. Uh, if if something is important to you, you'll never forget it. What I've noticed that at Fairfield uh, specifically is it's it's one of the most mindful campus, probably the most mindful campus I've ever been on. People really pay attention. They notice new things. Um, they care. Uh, so it, it, every, everything I'm saying doesn't, has, I haven't seen anybody do anything improperly in any sense. It's just my own uh, my own growth in knowing how to treat other people. Um, it is something, though, you'll notice that a lot of uh, online lectures or, or other places, or if you go to a seminar, especially if it's, um, even if it's in person, there's, there is this way that people tend to think of each other, right, as buckets, and especially in, in a relationship. If you're, like, if I'm talking to you, right, if, if we have something we need to talk about, um, it's very easy to slip into the feeling that I just need to dump a lot of information at you. And then I assume you know it because it's in your bucket, right? You know, that's exactly related to a question that one of our viewers is asking us right now. So let me put it up on the screen. Somebody is asking, given a fixed amount of time, is it better to teach a little or a lot? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I, I think the maybe one way of thinking about it is you, you never, there's no such thing as teaching. You can't teach. All you can do is give hints and somebody else will learn, right? They te you teach yourself. Everything you've ever learned, you've taught yourself, right? Other people can just give you hints that there's something interesting here to look at. You know what I mean? I'm actively typing in there's no such thing as teaching. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's why I mean a lot of a lot of people go towards this approach eventually. You know, having more projects, having more uh, student interactions, more questions, more presentations. Um, but I, I and I think it's it's a natural progression. It's just that this is the only way knowledge can be generated. So why not embrace it as early as possible? Um, here's another question that we have from the audience. If anybody can understand what you're teaching, does that mean that everybody can? If anybody can understand, does that mean everybody can? Yeah, I think basically, yes. There's obviously some things like uh, like calculus. You can teach calculus to almost any grade human being. You know, you could teach it to a sixth grader. You could teach them calculus. It's just there's a hurdle of vocabulary, right? There's certain things, but there is, yes, if it's understandable, anybody can understand it. It just maybe takes more time. So it sounds like there, there's a combination of techniques that you've developed to teach in this way. And it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, also to have conversations with people that are important to you in this way. What are some of those techniques? So suppose somebody is with us and they're thinking about, oh, I agree with Philip, this, this makes sense. I don't want to teach. I don't want to treat somebody as just a vessel for everything I spew and they want to get more creative. I would imagine creating your own techniques could take some effort. What are some techniques you suggest to try? Um, the the most valuable one I think is making puzzles. It's a little bit difficult. So uh, every professor, every teacher, every human being has been in two different kinds of teaching situations. One is when you know a lot about the subject and you're super comfortable with it, right? If you're, you know, talking about yourself, for example, or something that you happen to know. Or you've, you're in a situation where you have to teach somebody something that you don't quite know. You have a book and whatever, but you don't really know many chapters ahead, let's say. You know what I mean? Um, I know what you mean. <laughs> so uh, in the, making a puzzle is really hard for that other situation where you don't know ahead. But if it's, a, if it's your field, if this is what you do on a daily basis, then you can do something that those other kinds of teachers can't do, which is come up with an interesting puzzle that people have to think about and create. Uh, for sports analytics, uh, here's a puzzle. Uh, which is a larger number, would you say, three or two? I would say three. I think your instincts are spot on that. So if you're shooting a field goal, do you, should you shoot a three-pointer or a two-pointer? If you're the same amount of defended and you can get it in the, the same percentage, of three. Good. So then if we go through some adding You're percentages. You're so accomplished already. I feel so, so spot on, so accomplished. Okay. You're 100%. You're, you're brilliant. So if the three-pointer you're shooting with a certain percentage, let's say 40%, and the two-pointer with a certain percentage, let's say 45%, or whatever it is, we figure out the numbers. We talk about expected value. It looks like shooting a three-pointer is better than shooting a two-pointer. Okay? So far, so good. Everyone's on board. Here's the puzzle. Why didn't – well, here's the first puzzle. Uh, I'll tell you, Steph Curry is the greatest three-point shooter probably in the history of the world. He shoots, uh, I don't remember exactly, but let's say something like 13 to 15 three-pointers every game. Okay? How many do you think Larry Bird shot per game on average? I would say the same. Sounds reasonable, right? He was one of the greatest three-point shooters of all time. He had iconic three-point shootouts, wearing the warm-ups, yeah, walking into the winner's circle. Every, great, right? Daggers. Three! Three attempts a game. Three. So my question is, that these are attempts. Yes. So also with Curry, yes. Yes. And they shoot roughly the same percentage. Maybe Curry's a little bit better. But imagine if Larry Bird had ab knew back then what Curry knows now, which is three is larger than two, which you already had the intuition to understand. Why didn't he sh attempt 15 three-point shots a game? He was obviously less defended back then than Curry is today, right? Because everyone's like, go ahead, shoot a three, right? Maybe you defend it a little bit, but certainly, certainly he could have shot more three-pointers than long two-pointers that he was shooting. Agreed? Maybe, but it seems like there are other dynamics going on. What the coach said to do, what the team dynamics were. I, it's I don't Larry know. Bird. What is, who cares what the coach says? <laughs> I was going to say, give me the ball, let me launch the three, right? Uh, but it's not just Larry. Larry's an example. But the entire league never shot as much as it's shooting now. Why? Even the Phoenix Suns of, say, 2003, they were one of the first people, to, first teams to start shooting lots of threes. They would now be one of the bottom shooting three-point teams. And it's only been, what, 10, 15 years or something. It's just grown tremendously. Why didn't people shoot more threes earlier? That's a puzzle, right? It's already interesting. Uh, but the next puzzle is, as in an analytics exercise, well, what would have happened if... 
What if Larry Bird had averaged 15 more attempts at the three than the two? And that opens up a whole bunch of questions. Rather than just me telling you what would have happened, you start thinking to yourself, well, where would it have come from, like you said, right? Wh which twos would he have shot less of? What would that have done to the scoring average? How would that have changed the championship chances? Would he have won in 1987 and 88, whatever, right? And what he lost. Um, what would have happened to his career, which was beset by injuries and hurt? You know, if you're playing in the paint, you're getting bumped all the time. He once lifted up his T-shirt to show a, a journalist who was asking him, you know, how, how is it down there? Is it really as rough as it looks? He pulled it up. It's all black and blues everywhere, right? And imagine if he had a back. He could shoot threes. He could play more years. He could be more effective. Uh, that would have changed the history of the world, right? So now that, that's, a, that's a puzzle way of looking at it. If, if you don't know how to do analytics, it's hard to imagine because analytics is like breathing. Everyone knows how to do it. Right. But if you don't know how to teach it, you might think, no, better I, I start with what's a T-step test? What's a regression? How do you get data? How do you collect it? Right. And that kind of approach, if you go textbook oriented, I don't think is as effective as posing a puzzle. And now people are encouraged to learn whatever tool you need. Whatever. I need to learn regression. I'll learn regression because this is interesting to me. So this one sounds like telling stories. You're calling it making puzzles, but it also sounds like telling the dramatic story. Um. It's nice to make things dramatic, sure. <laughs> yeah, that can't hurt, and stories are fine. But ultimately, the what what makes a story dramatic is the puzzle, right? You can t you can talk all the scenery you want, and the characters and whatever. But if there's not some intellectually interesting puzzle in there, you'll you'll turn the book over. Yep. Uh, this reminds me of research that Adam Grant quotes a lot on uh, Beethoven and Mozart research in the sense of they wrote much more. So people think they're amazing because their music is so amazing, but they actually wrote so much more than other musicians of their time. Um, so I think if I remember, uh, uh, Ellen Langer, I think Adam Grant was one of her students. I'm not sure, but mindfulness, uh, there's an approach to mindful learning uh, that also takes the same epistemological point, but to an even higher level. Uh, we don't, if you learn from a typical textbook, it's, it's in absolute terms. Right, it would say this happened here. The Civil War had these three reasons. Whatever mm -hmm. you learn it, you memorize, take the test, you forget it. If you just this is research that uh, Ellen Langer has done out of Harvard. If you change the absolute wording to conditionalized, this may be one of the reasons. What what a simple shift, right? This could be perhaps one of the. Uh, then wh whether you're testing undergraduate, graduates, middle school, high school students, whatever, it turns out they learn the same amount of content. They'll do just as good as the quiz on the test on the content knowledge based stuff, but they can apply it to novel situations much better. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. So just uh, entering in a little bit of doubt makes them think a little wider. Why did, Why does it happen? Why did, Why is it that application increases? They've become more mindful. My favorite example of this is that you uh, get two groups. One group, you. Sh uh, this is another experiment she did. You give them both a dog's chew toy, right? Uh, and then a little bit later, one experiment say this is a dog's chew toy. The other one, you say this may be a dog's chew toy. Later on, they need a, They need to erase something. They don't have an eraser. Some of them will think to use the, the rubber chew toy as an eraser, but only from the group that where it said may be. If you've become mindful, now you're generating knowledge. You're not a bucket. Yeah, very cool. At this point in the program, we asked the people who are with us today, what are your takeaways from what Philip has been saying? What is something that you might go forward and do? What's a takeaway you have or an action you, you might take? And as you're typing that into the comments, and we'll share that if you type it in, I'm also going to uh, ask Philip our two concluding questions. For people who have been with us today and who've been listening to this, what is a thought you want to leave them with? Uh, appreciate uncertainty. Things are not always as they seem. And how is that related to the people are not buckets? And to because me? they're not buckets. Uh, you, you're not just filling them with water. You're filling them with wonder and let them create new knowledge from outside. Thank you. And the last question, if you could snap your fingers and almost everyone in the world were to take some action, what would you want that action to be? Well, I just quote Ellen Langer. Notice three new things. Look around you, notice three things you've never noticed before, and really notice them. Uh, because when you do that, then you you learn to appreciate that there's a lot of things you don't know and that you're missing, that uncertainty is part of everything that is in the world, that what you thought you knew about other people may be wrong, and everything. You can You can start to embrace uncertainty rather than fear it. And just to summarize, Philip, could you bring us home and summarize with people aren't buckets? What do you really mean by that? And what are actions people should take? When you're talking to a person, don't think of them as a computer or a bucket or something that you're just dumping stuff into. They're basically you. 
And they're in this moment is all you have. Right now, you're telling them one particular thing. Yes, you'll tell them the punchline later, but you have to make sure that the setup is good. <laughs> nice. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you next time.